team. Uh, and uh, so I thought I'd come and share a little bit about that with you guys. Um, first, a bit about who I am. Um, I've had various rules with roles with the Joomla project since uh, 2005, 2006, uh, including the development documentation uh, team leader, uh, Bug Squad co-maintainer. Uh, for a while, I sort of was the one who pressed the button on the 1.5 releases. Uh, I was a production working group leadership team member. I know that's a mouthful, but there you go. <laughs> uh, and uh, most recently, I've been uh, Joomla platform, uh, Joomla framework maintainer, um, along with the talented team of other gentlemen. Uh, so today, uh, I'll give you a brief introduction of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to give you a brief history of the World Wide Web, uh, and not just a random one, but sort of to uh, direct us to think about some things about how we've interacted with the web and how that has uh, changed over the years. Um, and out of that, I'm going to give sort of an overview of why APIs or why um, web services and, and REST and all that sort of stuff is important. Uh, then I'm going to run through uh, an example and a demo um, with some code, both in Node.js uh, and in uh, PHP, and sort of uh, show how they can work together um, on a single page. Uh, and then if there's time at the end, we'll go through some questions. Okay, so first of all, a brief history of the web with pictures. Uh, so back in the day, circa 1995, uh, the web used to be a collection of HTML files uh, scattered with images, icons, and logos. So you would pull out your text editor um, or... Uh, you know, they had like front page uh, a little bit later, but you know, you'd type in your HTML, you get all your markup right, and you you know upload your images, and you know you found a little space of uh, disk on a server somewhere, and you uploaded there, and um, people could view it. It was primarily passive, uh, so you could click on links to other pages, but things were mostly static. Um, if you came back to a page, uh, you know other people weren't doing anything that was going to influence that page or change anything. Uh, and creating content was hard. Um, markup falls apart. Uh, there are obvious challenges with that. So, a little flashback. We have Alta Vista. <laughs> we have this awesome site that I found, the Klingon <laughs> Language Institute. These are the sort of sites that we've had in the past. Uh, a random one I found, a vanilla sort of life, but hardly plain. Somebody's, you know, their personal homepage, they went and said, oh, I have this great idea for a site that I want to share with the world, uh, and bingo, you have that. Enter CGI. Uh, when I say CGI, do people know what that is? So, okay, good. Uh, so CGI gives you the ability to generate dynamic pages. So no longer can you... Um, you know, just upload your site, but you can, uh, you know, actually have interactions, and uh, you can add all sorts of nifty doodads to your page, <laughs> like <laughs> web counters. Everybody remember those? So with CGI, some sites even take things as far as storing data in flat files on the web server. Enter guest books. So. I'm sure you all remember these. You go to a website and they're like, well, I don't know what else to do with my web page, so I'm going to add a guest book. <laughs> so you can fill in a little bit of information about yourself and a little message, and you can go and you can see what other people have written about on that page. It's a flashback of Amazon circa a long, <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> Enter GeoCities. Uh, it becomes easier for users to create their own homepage on the World Wide Web. You can add images easier, and sometimes you can even add music. I mean, if your website does not play Beethoven, or at least asks you to download and install a plugin like RealPlayer, don't bother, right? So there's a GeoCities gem that I came across. You can add fancy backgrounds and borders and all that sort of fun stuff. Then enter the CMS, right? And this is where we play a large part in this history. So templates and contents are separated. Uh, so you can at least get some guidance, right? You have your idea for content, and you can pick from a wide range of templates and make your site look a little bit more appealing. 
Um, it empowers users to create their own websites uh, like they never could before. Uh, and content is now stored in databases, which is a little bit more performant. You can scale a little bit better than flat files. Uh, and every page is generated with a script and the entire thing. Um, so with CGI, generally you're adding a little bit uh, here, a little bit there. Um, with the CMS, every page is you know, running through a complex PHP program and out pops your HTML. <coughs> if we have Mambo back in the day, <coughs> I'll just sort of flip through these here. Then Joomla 1.0 rolls around. Your drop down menus there with the Joomla flash uploader. You know, 2.5, I think that is. This is a uh, version of three. So, but the primary interaction with your web browser, with websites, is still the web browser. You can get uh, a feed of content from a site, but it's hard to automate it. It's hard to interact with that content. So, um, if you want to update, um, you know, taking. Uh, uh an item from Twitter or an item from Facebook. Uh, there aren't easy APIs to do that without modifying your site. Inter-system communication is hard. And it reminds me of back in the day, I had these mutual funds and I was a numbers guy, right? So I wanted to keep track of, you know, I want to get a graph of, you know, how my mutual funds have gone up and down over the months or over the whatever. So. The bank I had that held the mutual funds had a website that you could get these prices every day, right? But they only had the price for the day. So off I went to write a Perl script which would, you know, download this page and parse out all this HTML and, you know, it was great. It worked for a couple weeks and then they slightly changed their markup and it fell apart. And so you have to, you know, keep, keep up to date with what the, um, with what the website producer is doing, right? Because it's, it's not designed to be read by computers or by systems. <coughs> so recent years, we have seen the rise of the API. If you think back to api.joomla.org, uh, if anybody visited it back when it first kind of was born, um, it was a list of functions, of classes, and methods for a library written in a specific programming language. So API, it was, uh, Joomla framework classes uh, that developers could use to uh, use parts of the Joomla framework in their extensions. Uh, extensions had to be written in PHP. They <coughs> all had to live on the same system uh, and they are all tightly integrated and coupled. And here's one of the uh, old Joomla AP API references, right? So you have your, this is part of uh, what is now J database your load object method, uh, description of what it does, right? So this is all in PHP. The definition of API has changed in common usage today. Uh, an API is now frequently recognized as a way to interact with a website or a system. So Facebook publishes an API. Websites are publishing APIs that allow you to uh, create content, uh, update content, um, and manip manipulate it from a system or from a machine. Uh, there's been various flavors of this. There's SOAP, uh, which was kind of a Java thing. It was fairly complicated, um, but you could do some neat things with it. Uh, if anybody remembers back in the day, we had a XML RPC layer from Joomla, right? We experimented with that, um, decided we didn't like it and tore it apart. Uh, JSON RPC, you know, uh, calling a procedure uh, via JSON, uh, JSON WSP, uh, WSDL, uh, and sort of the one that seems to be gaining <coughs> ground is uh, RESTful JSON. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about what REST is later, but everything talks over JSON objects. And everybody's doing APIs, right? Google has an API, Facebook, eBay, Twitter, GitHub, Amazon, Microsoft, Wikimedia. It's the language of the world today. It's how systems <coughs> interact. And so why APIs? It's e first of all, it's easy to share and propagate content. So think about um, 
you know, if you were producing a video, you had a video production company, uh, you wanted to automate uh, doing your post-production of that company, you want to uh, do your transcoding, you want to upload it to YouTube, and then once the video is uploaded to YouTube, you want to post a link to your Facebook site and your Twitter feed so that people can find that video. This is what APIs give us, the, the ability to take all these disparate systems that are spread across the internet and weave them together into in new and interesting ways. It also allows you to separate the server from the client. So uh, if you think about your traditional Joomla site, you have a PHP application uh, that is going to generate a whole bunch of markup and return it to your browser. Um, if you pull that same markup up on the phone, sometimes it's going to work well, sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes you're okay getting along with a uh, regular um, website, but sometimes you want something that's going to be native. Um, APIs make mobile far, far easier. They also enable others to build new and interesting interfaces for you. So you no longer have to tailor your application to every specific user. You publish a, an API and somebody else can say, oh, I like this, but I want to make the interface like this, or I want to interact with it like this. If you pop up your phone and you do a search for Twitter applications, right, you see scads of them. You know, this is the sort of thing that APIs are enabling. The other thing that doesn't get talked about, well, maybe not so much, is language agnostic system interfaces. So um, RESTful JSON is a concept that spreads across programming languages. It isn't a PHP thing. It isn't a JavaScript thing. It's not a Python thing. It's everywhere. You can write an API in whatever language you want, and you can interface it from any other language. And you can easily tie <coughs> multiple systems using disparate te technologies together. So you can weave all these sort of systems that are spread out across the internet, the World Wide Web, and you can build them into one application. So the obvious question is, what language should we use? And it doesn't matter. Just pick one and build it. So the example that I'm going to run through um, is composed of three pieces. Uh, one is on the bottom, a Joomla framework layer, uh, which is going to be a very simple API. You're going to be able to uh, create an article, and you're going to be able to get a list of those articles. Uh, that is written on the Joomla framework, and I'll go through the code for that in a few minutes. Uh, the next layer up uh, is the Node.js layer. Uh, so that has uh, an activity service. So uh, I have a Fitbit, I've been really excited about it, and just this idea of being able to, I forgot at home, I'm really sad, so that's why it's not on me, but um, just the ability to track stuff, right? Because if you track things that you do, it helps you become more aware of them. Uh, so the Node.js layer is going to implement that activity service, so you're going to be able to upload an activity and then get a list of those activities. Uh, and then the Node.js layer is also going to have the proxy, so um, the web client up here, which will be written in JavaScript using Angular, which Herman mentioned in his last talk, um, is going to talk to this Node.js layer to both to the activity service and to the article service, but it's not going to know anything about how this down here is implemented. It just isn't going to matter. Uh, so first we have our PHP application. So here's my index.php. Uh, uh, I have declared an application class. I'm going to extend abstract web application. Uh, I'm going to have my router, my uh, dependency injection container, and the database object. Uh, I'm going to do my execution, which will basically um, route the request and call off my controllers. Uh, so I you know, do my initialization. Um, I load up my routes here. So you can see here I have defined uh, my articles routes. So they're going to go to an article list classes. I uh, load up my config. This is mostly boilerplate stuff. Um, I'm going to have two main controllers here. One is article list create. Um, so this is going to allow you to post an object to a list of items. 
Uh, I've defined uh, just two properties in my object, a title uh, and a body. They're going to be grabbed from my request here, uh, and I'm going to call them. Uh, I'm going to set a created date, and I'm going to store it into my database. And the other uh, controller I'm going to have is my article list get. So this is just going to do a simple uh, select uh, from the database, and it's going to return a JSON list. So I can head over here. Oh, let me just check, make sure that this is running. Yeah, and that's good. All right, so I'm going to start that up. And here is, that was running on 8080. So here you, and of course it's not going to work. Okay, so here I can post that. any luck I can now see if I can get over to here. Then I can get my array. All right, so that's the article I just created. So here we have in PHP we have uh, the ability to create an article and the ability to um, get a list of articles back. Okay, so now that that part is done, <coughs> we're going to flip over to Node.js. Has anybody worked with Node at all or have any familiar work? Okay, so some. Uh, this is a very simple example. Um, one of the main differences between what you would typically do with a PHP application uh, and a Node.js application is a Node.js application, you're going to fire up uh, a web server. So uh, when you uh, get a hosting service, most of the time, they're going to have an Apache server, which is going to load up your PHP site and is going to run that script when a <coughs> request comes in. Um, with Node.js, you handle that yourself. Um, one of the advantages of Node.js that is touted widely is uh, asynchronous I.O. So if you ever think about, you know, you have a long query that takes, you know, a second and a half, right? Um, you can fire off that query in Node.js, do a whole bunch of stuff while that query is running. And then once it's done, um, you know, you can go and pick that up and continue from there, right? So the ability to start um, I.O. intensive operations that, you know, take time and do them in parallel rather than in PHP where you have to kind of wind <coughs> them up and do them sequentially. So you can sometimes get, uh, for certain applications, uh, a faster response time out of that. Uh, so I'm going to use something called Mongoose, which is a uh, object relational mapper uh, layer for um, <coughs> Node.js. And here I'm going to define my activity service. Uh, so this is uh, get, so that is my request verb. Uh, so I'm going to get a list of activities. Uh, I'm going to go call my um, data model, which is activity. I'm going to find all of them, and I'm going to send them back. So um, what's happening here is, so I'm defining this root get with the path, and then you pass it a function that is going to handle that request, and that function gets passed a request, a response object, and next. I won't talk about next. You can look at that on your own. Um, and so... I have available to me this request object, which I'll use down in post. Uh, but here, I take that response and I send <coughs> activity. So then here, I'm defining uh, a post request uh, for the same path, my same request, response, and next. Uh, I'm going to set a set a header that's going to tell the user what type of response you're going to get back. Um, and here I'm looking at that request object. Uh, I'm going to get from the body the name property, uh, the value property, and I'm going to fill a timestamp with uh, date.now. And uh, 
So then there's a callback that happens after that uh, operation is finished. And when that callback gets called, I'm going to send that activity back to the browser. This is the final piece I have here, which is going to take um, any request method to slash articles. And it's actually going to uh, proxy this off to uh, my PHP layer here. So it is going to grab that request body that was sent to it, and it is going to post it on um, to my PHP Joomla framework application. Uh, down here, we're loading our static AngularJS site. So you can see here, this is running on uh, here, port 3000. Okay, so right now I have no activities there. And I can now send a post. <coughs> and I need a name. And so my activity names are going to be like jog. And it's going to have a value, which is a length of time that it was done. So maybe I went jogging. Uh, oh I was pretty lazy that day, so I went for five minutes, got tired, and went home. Okay, so you can see here that I also have my article service mesh. So I can call my Node.js service, I can get that same list of articles out. So this is a unified interface. <coughs> Okay, so the next step we're going to do, we're going to build uh, an AngularJS app. So uh, this is in here, right here. So I have controllers. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but this is your client application, right? Okay, so this is a very simple, very basic uh, AngularJS application. Uh, on my page, I have a mashup of activities on one side, uh, and then I have uh, articles on the other side. So here I can enter, uh, I slept for 10 minutes, uh, and then I create an article, say, uh, JBI Jab. Tasty treats for everybody. Okay. And there we go. You can see if I refresh the page that those items were still there. So uh, if we go back to here, you can see we had our three layers. We had uh, the Joomla framework layer, which is our framework application. <coughs> uh, sitting on top of that was our Node.js layer with uh, the activity service uh, and the proxy. Uh, and then we had the web client sitting on top. Now, of course, that's not the only way to do it. Um, so the example I gave shows an application where all the display logic lives in the browser. So, um, you know, there's no HTML being parsed by PHP or JavaScript. It's all just static files being sent out, and then the static files uh, make the call to your application to get the data to populate it. Um, 
you can also create an application that generates your page on the server and pre-populates your data. So, um, uh, as was mentioned before, Angular now has a, um, a library for AngularJS so that you can um, get that and populate it into um, your page and then also live update it, right? So you get really fresh dynamic pages, uh, but you also get them delivered with everything intact. Um, so if you're not familiar, like one of the issues with <coughs> delivering a fully HTML page and populating it later is that um, it can sometimes take like five or six requests to get all the data into your page, and so it's a bit more latency. Um, so you can also put, you know, put the PHP application on top, right? So I, I've seen one site where, you know, they've kind of started to shift everything to uh, a web services layer, um, but they still have this traditional Joomla website, right? And so um, they're keeping a lot of their application code and their display code, um, but instead of calling their models in Joomla, they're farming that off to a web service. Um, so you kind of get uh, advantages on the both worlds. Um, and you can mix and match how the pieces fit together. Um, and you can make them uh, fit any way you want. So the sky is really the limit. Uh, and the other thing I should mention, you know, I've given an example with Node.js and PHP, um, but where you, you can do other stuff with, you know, Python web services and any language you can dream up that you can write a web service in, um, you can mash them together, right? And you can either mash them, uh, yeah, just any way you can imagine, really. Uh, so that is what I had, and I would be happy to uh, entertain any questions or things that people wanted to verify. I'll also add that I'll be putting the code and stuff up for this uh, on GitHub later. Uh, yeah, you had a question there. Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, we've done that too, um, where uh, you know you have like a scheduler, right? And um, Node.js is nice sometimes to act as a scheduler because uh, it's asynchronous, uh, so you can fire off, you know, say ten jobs at once, um, and have it sort of do the controlling. Um, but from Node.js, you can fire off PHP CLI applications um, and have that run. So. Um, Sometimes the technology you want to work with, the type of database you want to connect to or whatever, it's more established, more mature in PHP or some other language. So you can stick that domain, uh, you know, that chunk of your code, keep it in PHP because it works, it's tested, it's proven, um, but then sort of mash it together for, you know, execution-wise uh, from like a Node.js application. Uh, well, you've, there's two different questions there, right? One is uh, Node.js, and I think, um, I think it's getting your head around asynchronous programming, right? So uh, um, let me switch back to. There we go. Keep getting caught. Uh, this was here, right? So in a typical program, you might expect that, you know, this line of code is always going, this line of code here, yeah, what happened? Okay. So for example, right, you might expect that this line of code here is always going to execute before this line of code here. But because of the way that Node is set up, this, l this code here is going to get executed when that particular request gets fired. And so I think the hardest part is getting your head around you know, when things execute and also the scopes of variables, right? So 
Um, just because I set a variable here doesn't mean that that value is going to be a certain thing at that point in time. Um, and then the other question I think you were asking was about Like in terms of a single page application or yeah, I think just the functional, like the functional asynchronous nature of it is probably the biggest thing to kind of get your head around it and figure that out. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I think when I think about um, the framework in Node.js, it's, it's bringing the framework to a place where we can enable um, you know, companies or organizations to write applications <coughs> that can mash together all sorts of different technologies like this, right? So I don't know how applicable it's going to be to the CMS, for example, where you have people running um, you know, one PHP application on one server. Um, that's certainly going to depend on hosting availability. I mean, let's face it, one of the reasons that almost like the three major uh, CMSs are written PHP is because if you sign up for web hosting, they're going to have PHP. It's ubiquitous, whereas getting node hosting is <coughs> typically a lot more difficult and more challenging. So um, I think where you'll see this sort of be more useful is where you're doing projects with sort of various systems that are interacting together and that sort of stuff. All right, well, thanks so much for your time, everybody, and <laughs> hopefully you learned something from it.